we can get started here. So welcome again. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for being here for the first lecture in our summer lecture series for the Poly Hill Arboretum. We're really happy to have you all here and we're excited to have Chris Roddick here. Um, he's an arborist and he's the foreman of grounds at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Um, so Chris is going to be talking about all things trees, which is obviously our favorite topic here at the Poly Hill Arboretum. Um, he started his career at the Scott Arboretum as an intern, and then he was an arborist at the Scott Arboretum and eventually moved on to the Brooklyn Botanic Garden where he now works. So he has many years of learning about trees in the Northeast, and he's going to share some things that he's learned about particular trees and some stories that he has from his time caring for trees. So thank you so much to Chris for being here. I also wanted to thank our sponsors. Um, so this lecture is sponsored by Bartlett Tree Experts and also the Dukes Conservation District. So thank you to them for making this possible. Um, and thank you to Chris for being here. So I will turn it over to you, Chris. Okay, thank you, Liz, and uh, just thank everyone for uh, coming out, I guess, to uh, uh, to this lecture today and to Poly Hill for uh, um, sponsoring these lecture series. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about trees for the next hour or so. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about my experience uh, growing trees and selecting trees, caring for trees. Um, and I emphasize, I'm going to talk about my experience. So I've um, been doing this for 30 some years and I've learned a lot and I've changed sort of my practice over time. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to go kind of go through a list of trees that, um, that I, that I um, enjoy growing that I think are like uh, quality trees to grow in the Northeast. Um, and we'll kind of go tree by tree and I'll kind of tell you my experience about um, how I've, grown them, how I've cared for them over time, and then we'll save some time at the end for some questions. Uh, what I had to drop from this lecture were sort of my tree jokes, since I can't see anybody. I don't know if they're funny or not. So for example, like, um, did you know uh, for, uh, uh, see, I can't even do the jokes properly. But like, you know, um, so I'm going to skip the jokes parts, and, um, and we'll just kind of go into the, into the lecture. So let's start off here. Oh, Got to change my screen here. It's not changing. All right, so I'm running into technical difficulties already. Here we go. All right, so this is where I work. So this is the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. It's a uh, 52 acres um, in the middle of Brooklyn. It's kind of a little green oasis, and I've been there since like the mid '90s. Um, and sort of my practice as an arborist working there, and that's me up in the left-hand corner, um, is, is caring for these trees. So everything from, you know, um, giant oak trees to um, we have a huge collection of cherry trees. And over the years, kind of like honing my practice of like, you know, what's really worked, what hasn't worked. And one of the advantages of being in public horticulture is that as you work on trees, you can kind of see them over time. So I've been at the Botanic Garden for 25 plus years. Um, so I, you know, I've planted trees, I've seen them grow over time, I've pruned them many times. And I can kind of see where I've made mistakes and I kind of see like, you know, oh, that actually worked. Um, so that's been like, that's, that for me has been like the, the greatest um, learning experience. Um, and I'm also gonna talk a little bit about my experience um, just growing trees for myself, just sort of my personal experience. So I've taken all my professional knowledge and I've kind of moved that into um, this little Brooklyn backyard that we have. So our backyard is kind of the left side of the screen and that's my neighbor's uh, sweet birch tree on the right side. And one of the reasons why we uh, uh, got this house in Brooklyn is we walked out the back and we saw the sweet giant sweet birch tree and it's like, oh, we have to live here. That's our back view. Um, of our house. So I've taken that some of that experience and I've, I've put it to use um, sort of cultivating this space in this urban environment. I've also been doing some work in Connecticut on, on a larger property of my in-laws and sort of having like this huge like 18 acre area to kind of play around with. And so I've kind of taken that knowledge and, and used it there and learned a lot of things along the way. 
All right. So, but my um, sort of inspiration for trees. So I've um, just to kind of get everyone sort of excited about trees. Um, trees are are some of the oldest among the oldest living um, and and largest organisms in the world. Um, trees are, trees are very successful. They've been around for millions of years, and they and one of the things that the trees have been able to do over this time is because unlike us, trees are rooted in so they can't move away from the problems. They're very easy targets. So they kind of stand and grow in the same place. And for some trees, that's, that's hundreds or even thousands of years. Um, so trees over time have learned to adapt and adjust to, um, you know, to the environment around them. So over that time, um, they've had to figure out ways that if, you know, when you get attacked, you have to be able to to defend yourself. And if you can't move away, how do you do that? So trees have learned to like make compounds that, that defend off herbivores from eating them, uh, to fight off insect infestation, to uh, fight off fungal, fungal infections. Um, they've also learned to communicate. Um, there's a lot of great work out lately about how trees communicate through, um, through networks um, called the wood wide web underneath the ground. Um, and how like trees can communicate not only with one another, but with other organisms. Um, and so trees really sort of evolved over this time to be this really successful organism. Um, and that's kind of been my inspiration of learning like how to care for trees. Um, but my initial sort of introduction into trees, I, uh, as Liz says, I started at the Scott Arboretum um, when I was pretty young. And the Philadelphia and Scott Arboretum's in the Phil just outside of Philadelphia, and Philadelphia is this great um, area for um, horticulture. Um, but at the time, you know, the, the type of horticulture that was that was kind of taught and um, sort of practiced was what you know what was called ornamental horticulture. Um, so, so when I took classes in um, Amwood uh, Temple and at um, Longwood Gardens, I was studying ornamental horticulture. So the way you kind of view trees was sort of as ornaments. So as like, you know, they had, you know, something attractive about them. So pretty flowers, um, fall color, interesting bark. Um, so that's, so kind of learning trees from that view of, um, you know, what's interesting for us to look at or, which, um, or maybe the view like what's interesting, like can we eat something from this tree? Um, so that, that was sort of like a perspective I had for a while. So the beginning of, of my tree care practice was like, you know, selecting trees that were that were um, interesting to grow because of the ornament, ornamental value of them. And that kind of switched over, over time as I like started like sort of diving deeper into how trees grow, um, you know, what makes, how do they work? Um, and then you start kind of taking hikes in the woods and you think you know a lot about trees, but just take a hike in the woods and you're just sort of scratching your head. Here's this little grove of oak trees growing in just on this rock, rocky outcrop. This is in Harriman State Park in upstate New York. And there's just not much soil there. Like, you know, I was learning like, you gotta have lots of soil. You gotta have garden soil, build the soil up. And here's these trees just literally growing on rock with just inches of, top, inches of soil ab above them. Um, and so just, just sort of um, studying with different people. So going from kind of a, a mindset of ornamental horticulture to um, working with um, and studying with people like um, Alex Shiro and um, Kevin Smith from uh, USDA and some of the work they've done. And they really talked more about trees as systems as like the forest is kind of being this big system and trees are sort of an agent in that system kind of like bringing um, energy into the system. So trees worldwide are, are among the um, uh, organisms that catch a lot of the solar energy from the sun and they convert that energy into um, usable food. So into sugars that other organisms can take from. So they're kind of like the mother, the mother plant of a lot of different organisms. And in this time, trees have made like these connections and partnerships with many different organisms that benefit both the tree and the other organisms. Um, so kind of like, like trying to switch this from like growing trees as ornaments to growing trees. Oh, trees are part of the system and trees are very complex. And there's a lot of like associations and, um, 
this um, involved with trees. So how can I use that in my practice? How can I like grow trees on an arboretum or in a botanic garden? Uh, I'm not growing trees in a forest, but can I, can I use some of that information to better my practice to grow trees? Okay, so here, here and this is, this is a, um, a landscape again, this is in upstate New York. Um, this is slightly like a disturbed landscape. So this is a forest, um, but there's a lot of deer, deer pressure in this forest. So there's not much understory, but I, but I always like kind of like hiking in this landscape. So this, this kind of reminds me of, um, you know, sort of a park setting, if you will, kind of sometimes what we imagine what a park should look like. So imagine instead of the sedges on the ground, you, you had turf grass, um, but, but you can see the complexity in here. So you have a lot of trees that are growing close together. Um, there, there's ground cover, there's um, dead wood in the, in the picture, there's trees that are dying, trees that are falling over. And, and this to me is, um, you know, kind of, a, kind of a healthier landscape and then just an, like a, an ornamental landscape, whether in a, a home garden or in a botanic garden. So, and also like, I'm always, you know, in the beginning, I'm always looking at trees from the ground up. Like you look at the trees, like what can you see? And that's how you describe the tree. But, but almost a quarter, like from a third to half the, the mass of the trees underneath the ground. So trees, the trees that we grow in the Northeast have oftentimes have massive root systems and they're not very deep. Most of the root systems are within like the top 18 inches of the soil. Um, and probably most of that is within the top, like, especially in around New York City, most, most of their tree roots are within the top six inches of the soil because soils are so compacted that, that roots need oxygen and the organisms that are associated with the roots also need oxygen. Just like you can see the, the uh, fungal hyphae growing, growing around this tree root here um, that creates a new organ called a mycorrhizal, uh, called mycorrhizae. And mycorrhizae is one of these associations that, that trees have with fungi that, that benefit both the fungi and the tree. Um, so I kind of wanted to bring that knowledge into my practice. Like, you know, I, if I'm going to grow healthy trees, I better have healthy soil because not only do I need to grow a tree, but I need to grow, I need to grow mycorrhizal fungi to, um, to help the health of the tree. Um, most, most plants worldwide have, have this association with, fun, with fungi. And all trees that grow in the Northeast have this, have this mycorrhizal fungi. Um, you can take a tree um, and grow it in sterile soil. And if you're uh, watering it and you, and you fertilize it, you can get a tree to grow. But what makes a tree healthy is when it has these associations. Okay, so this is our um, dream home. This is our, our little backyard in Brooklyn. This is, um, I believe in, 2013, and we, we thought we were the luckiest people in the world. We had this beautiful 20 foot by 60 foot lot uh, behind our house, um, and it's self facing, and it's just covered with every single invasive weed you could think of. Um, <laughs> there was a few tree stumps in there, but we were like, yeah, this is, this is it. This is heaven right here. Um, and so we started our work. We started cleaning this up, and we try to sort of take our knowledge um, from, from our gardening experiences. My wife, Rebecca, who's also a horticulturist, and we've, we've sort of transformed how we, how we like, take our professional skills and, and actually put it in practice in our own backyard. And, you know, we, we're going to select trees. We're going to, like, work the soil. We're going we're gonna to do things to grow, grow the healthiest garden that we can. Okay. And this is sort of the beginning of it. So one thing we wanted to do is have this, have a forest. We wanted a forest in our backyard. So this is a little like um, 12 foot deep and 20 foot wide forest. And actually there's about a dozen trees um, in this photograph. There's a bald cypress, there's some um, uh, sassafras, uh, amelanchia. And what we quickly found out was that um, when we go shopping at nurseries, um, you kind of go with a plan of things you want to pick up, and then you end up picking up about ten other things because, hey, there's hey, this, look how cool this plant is. Let's let's do that. Um, so next thing you knew, we we had an explosion of plant, 
which was which was good because we're gonna it's gonna be thinned over time. And what we're trying to do is almost trying to grow what's called a, a dense hedgerow here. One of the problems with our backyard was like the the weed pressure was this so horrific and also we have a, a young child and we're concerned about lead in the soil so we actually like out of the course of that whole backyard we dug out about six inches of soil through the entire backyard um, and removed it and brought in about 10 to 12 yards of fresh soil and kind of capped off the soil back there so got rid of some of the weeds doing that and also got rid of what we hope is we sort of capped off any um, lead exposure that you might get from the soil but in the very back, there was this little mound where the forest is, and that was built up. And digging in there, we found an old bed spring. We found it, there's a little garage behind it. We found like they when they did demolition, like most of that debris just ended up in that bed right there. Um, so we kind of stopped with that, and we just started planting up. And our and our idea was to use. To, to cover the ground. Like we, we didn't want to see the, see the ground at all. We wanted to grow it as densely as possible. So have a, a ground layer like you would see in a forest and then a, a shrub layer and then eventually a canopy layer. And that wouldn't allow weeds to come up through there. So that was our plan. So we did a lot of shopping in nurseries and I do this professionally, like finding plants for the botanic garden or for clients. And so, you know, I was trying to like, there, there's some pitfalls of buying plants. So one way you can buy plants is very popular now, container grown plants. And when we, um, and there's some problems associated with container grown plants, mostly that you can get girdling roots within the, within the container. So if, unless the nursery is very responsible about like really upsizing the pots, you end up with uh, a root system that looks like this, that, you know, in the, from the, from the, from the pot up, you might have a decent looking plant, but from below, um, you have serious problems, and this is never going to develop into a healthy plant. Okay. Um, your other choice is in the nursery of by bald and burlap. Um, and, and we've done a lot of this for like bigger properties or for the botanic garden. And some trees respond, still respond really well to this, this type of um, harvesting. Um, and there's, there's some problems associated with it. A lot of nurseries will dig with a mechanical um, spade to dig it up, so it kind of tears and breaks roots as through the process. We also, um, the, the root, root system is massively reduced when they're harvesting, harvesting the tree or the plant. Um, and you can get things like girdling roots or the plant is, the tree is planted too deep within in the nursery. So when they dig the root ball, you have a smaller size uh, root system that you should have for the size of tree. <clears throat> so one thing we learned to do is like when we did buy ball and burlap is we almost bare root it and we do a lot of root pruning. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Also just sort of my practice over time is that we've, that I've learned that like um, trees kind of go through these, these um, stages, like from, 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 from a seedling to um, the formative stage and then further to the right over here until you're beginning to, to mature stage and then to eventually into a uh, senescent or veteran stage of a really old plant. And how you take care of the of that plant is gonna is gonna depend on what stage it is. The things you can do to this like very young tree or this formative stage, um, as far as harvesting for transplanting or planting or pruning, is gonna be a lot different than how you would take care of a mature tree. Um, when sort of the, the amount of the amount of resources a young tree has, if it's healthy, is way greater than the amount of resources available um, comparatively to an older tree. Um, so adjusting the practice um, just by like looking at a tree, not only by species, but like what stage of growth is it in? Okay. And also just the importance of um, putting trees together, like trees, most, most species of trees um, that we grow are, you know, somewhat of a forest species and they wanna grow together. They want not always the same species wanna to grow together like this grove here, um, this is, um, Don Redwood at the National Arboretum, um, but really like plants want to be, they want, they want to grow together and they, they connect and they um, can build the soil. So there's a lot of advantages is keeping plants to, like close together. And also the importance of having, you know, dead and dying plants within, within that um, um, growing. Uh, so leaving things like deadwood or stumps and as allowing things to break down and to build the soil over time. 
Okay. And then trying to incorporate um, in gardens and sometimes like a botanic garden where I work, it's really hard to um, incorporate deadwood into the garden. Like we like to put rocks around the gardens, but we don't like to leave logs and things. So kind of slowly over time, we're sort of working in certain areas of like, you know, when we remove a tree or when we had storm damage, like in Sandy, sometimes we're able to leave logs lay down in the soil in certain areas um, and allow those logs to break down and to help build up the soil and to cycle back the nutrients back into the, uh, back into the ground, which is gonna benefit the, the existing plants growing around it. Okay. One, uh, one other thing we're gonna talk about as we look at different trees is something that, um, as I look at different species of trees, and I, I adjust my practice to how well they can compartmentalize. So this is compartmentalization in woody plants is, is how woody plants sort of, um, sort of uh, fight off infection. Um, so plant, plants can't heal like you and I do. So when we get cut or infected, our body sort of responds um, with our immune system, but then we can grow, we can regrow cells and repair cells. Plants can't do that. Plants can only um, put new cells into new positions. So once something is infected, you can see on the left, there was a branch um, there at one time. So this is a dissective uh, crosscut of a, of a tree here. Um, and where that branch was, when that branch was removed, um, that was uh, the, the, the tree was open to infection. So the, the tree was able to wall off that infection and contain that infection to, um, uh, into certain areas of the, of the plant to keep it from spreading into the rest of the wood. So it does this uh, through a few processes, chemically mostly, um, and this is called compartmentalization. Um, and so some tree species can do this really well. So for example, like oak trees are pretty good compartmentalizers. That's why oak trees live for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and other trees like a willow tree is a very poor compartmentalizer. Willow trees kind of work on the like, live fast, die young kind of model. So they, they, will, they, will, they just kind of outgrow their problems. So when they become wounded or infected, they add new wood, but they're not very good at compartmentalizing and, and preserving the old wood behind them. So that's gonna change my practice on how, how, how I might prune a tree or how um, even, even like from transplanting a tree. Okay, so this is, um, this is on the left there, that's where we were in, in 2013. And on the right here is um, about two weeks ago. Um, so, so we've transformed this, this little space into, um, into a very complex um, garden. Um, and and we've, we've, we've gone from this evolution from uh, ornamental horticulture, where I was looking at plants as, as ornaments to doing something um, that I've learned a lot from my wife, Rebecca, and from work of like Doug Tallamy and other people is that using something what we call like um, uh, uh, horticulture based upon um, growing plants that, that are, are not only servicing, like providing ecological services, but, but, this, but providing um, function within the landscape. Um, so this ecological horticulture, we call it, um, we're, we're growing plants that are benefiting us. I mean, this is much better to look at our garden now than it was before in 2013. Um, and we selected plants not only because we enjoy those species and we want to look at the flowers, but they also have function. Um, so we're, we're growing plants that are going to like attract butterflies. We're going to grow plants that are going to attract. There's not a lot of wildlife in Brooklyn, um, but we want to you know, attract birds and other things. And so we're, we've kind of worked on this model of about like two thirds native plants, one third exotics, um, mostly because you know we're, we're also plant people and there's some plants we wanna grow that just because they're fun to grow. Um, but we wanna kind of build a landscape that's actually like sort of functioning in the real, functioning in the world and creating a small habitat. Um, and you know, if we could spread it out to our neighbors, we would. Okay, so kind of going through this, this process of, of sort of um, um, coming up this tree list I came up with for this talk. I've, I've um, thought about different trees that I, um, that, I, that I grow a lot 
um, that I have a lot of experience with, but also that are just sort of staple trees in the Northeast. And so some of these trees you'll recognize, it might be one or two that's a little less common, but I'm here to tell you my experience with growing them. Sugar maple, unfortunately, we couldn't grow uh, in our backyard in Brooklyn, but we have grown it up in, up in Connecticut in uh, Litchfield County. Um, and it's still one of the most popular trees sold in nurseries in the Northeast. Um, one of the things I find in my experience with, with um, sugar maple is like buy it bald and burlap. It rarely, um, rarely do you get a good root system when you buy a container grown, unless it's very, very small. And I do recommend in general, just, just buying plants on the smaller side. Um, and the, but this over time, this is what you can get. And this is oftentimes what people inherit these big old sugar maple trees in New England. Um, sugar maples are not very good compartmentalizers. They're kind of in the middle. Um, and so what happens is over time, when, when from storm damage, from pruning, um, from even tapping for, for, sugar, uh, for sugar maple, um, you get a lot of, you end up with these old trees with a lot of decay. So that really, um, so to manage these older trees often is there's um, a, a fine line of pruning. You wanna like keep the tree safe. We often um, use cables and non-invasive supports to keep the tree together. Um, but over time, they, they, they end up like falling apart. Um, so, so it's, it's one of those New England uh, trees that are just like, if you have a big property, you wanna grow them. If you do, um, if you do uh, sugar maple, you wanna, you wanna grow them. Um, what we're looking into right now, one of the problems with um, climate change in the, in the Northeast is that sugar maples are better adapted you know, for cooler weather. Um, and so we've been looking at this species of maple called black maple. Um, and trying to, you know, instead of planting sugar maple, is we're, is we're actually like uh, trying to find black maple to, uh, to replace some of the trees with. Um, unfortunately, they're very difficult to find in the nursery. I found a few uh, uh, sort of boutique nurseries that specialize in native plants, and I think I can get them small. So we're gonna order a bunch this year and hopefully plant them out next spring. So another, um, more adaptive tree maybe, especially in more of an urban area, we don't have a lot of space, is red maples. Red maples, um, there's a lot of different cultivars of red maples, beautiful flowers in the spring, beautiful fall color, much like the sugar maples, um, but they're a little more adaptable. These are also floodplain trees. Um, these, are, these are trees that are adapted to live in areas that often get flooded for part of the year. Um, and which, which is really well adapted to like high use areas. So if you have a lawn area that's irrigated or a soil that's compacted, it reduces the amount of oxygen that's in the soil. And these trees are better well adapted for that. Um, again, um, I've, I've seen these grown in, in like large containers, 15 plus gallon containers, but almost always you get a, a, a pretty poor root system from them. So you end up having to do a lot of root pruning when planting. So it's still a tree I would buy bald and burlap. I would also buy it as small as possible. Um, one of the things that, um, so I mentioned how the uh, uh, red maple is um, a floodplain tree. So if you look on the left, so these are called diffuse pores. So if you were to see the vascular system of the tree on the maple, you would see all these like, sort of uh, vessels that run through, run through the sapwood of the tree. And that's called diffuse pores, and that that allows the tree to, to move water pretty pretty regularly and pretty far back into the stem of the tree, compared to the oak tree on the right, which is called uh, ring porous. And ring porous trees have these big vessels that are, um, uh, are, are, are grow early in the spring, and then um, so each each one of these, I think I can point with my uh, thing. So each. Um, each ring or each uh, growth increment, um, you can see the early early vessels right here, and these are the later vessels, which are much smaller. So oaks, especially um, especially uh, trees like white oak, um, typically it can take up a lot of water in the spring, but less water uh, later in the year, later in the season, because of the smaller vessels. And oftentimes, um, maybe like two or three years back into the wood, the vessels become uh, clogged with um, tyloses, so they, they're unable to 
to move water more freely just on the outer layers of the tree. So this, this sort of affect the tree that if you have irrigation or, or if you're growing in a wet area, um, this tree could actually not take up that much water through those seasons. So a diffuse forest tree would be a better choice for that. Um, so that's, you know, one of the difference between like growing something like red maple is where if you're going to irrigate a lawn and things, that's just a better choice for, for, the, for that situation. Okay. Also maples, uh, red maples, sugar maples, Norway maples um, tend to have these much more shallower sort of um, woody roots. And that can be problematic in a, in a landscape. Um, again, you know, like I like to plant maples together. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of, of planting trees out in lawns. There's occasions where you, where you want to do that. Um, but this is not the best choice for that. Another maple I really like is a smaller native maple. Um, so uh, Acer Pans Pensylvanicum, the moosewood or striped maple. Um, this is a native tree. It's an understory tree, um, maybe 12, 15 feet tall. Um, and, and this is something you can plant out, you know, with, with it, it, would, it would do well in a bit of shade. You can grow in, in full sun. And there's some cultivars of this, but you get this big showy bark. And this is something um, that I see a lot hiking around upstate New York and southern New England. And it's become one of my favorite trees. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to, we weren't able to grow one in our backyard, but we're looking to um, grow a lot of them at, at the Botanic Garden in our native flora garden. Um, again, this is, this is something I would buy. Um, this is a tree that I, you typically get very small. Um, you get a, a um, kind of a sapling. It's probably going to be in a pot. Sometimes you can buy in bare root. They, they, they tend to get established fairly quickly and grow fairly quickly. Another tree um, is the Amelanchia or the service berry. And this tree is a native tree again throughout the Northeast. Um, there's some hybrids and cultivars. Um, Autumn Brilliance is a tree that's widely available in the landscape and you can grow it as a, as a, as a in tree form or sometimes in our, in our backyard in Brooklyn section, we have it as a, a shrub form. Um, and the, the advantage of it is, is right now um, it's, it's got berries. It's um, June berries, in other word. So it has, has a few common names, June berry, service berry. Um, and by this time of year, uh, we're, we've been harvesting berries off of it. And if you never tried them, they're, they're kind of sweet berry, a little bit, uh, reminds you a little bit of the taste of a blueberry. Um, but we've been baking with them. Um, I just picked a bunch today at work at the Botanic Garden. Um, so it's, it's a tree that like, that you get this early, early um, uh, flower display. Um, and then you get the berries. Now the berries, we, we pick them, but they're also, uh, birds love them. So um, last weekend we were in Connecticut and we saw cedar wax wings just to hang out in the trees all day, picking these berries off. So not only do you grow them for us, but we grow them from them. One thing I found about growing, here's my next slide. One thing I found about growing um, amelanchia or the service berry is that when you kind of put them together a lot like this, they tend to, you tend to get, some, they're in the rose family, um, rosaceae. So they tend to get some, some of the similar diseases you would get from like an apple tree or some roses, but they, they get a rust on their leaves. So when you, kind of plant them together when there's not much circulation, they, they tend to get rust and you kind of lose the fruit. Um, not all cases, but when, you, when they're a little more isolated, like kind of one off and then maybe one a little bit further away if you have room, um, they, you, you tend not to see that rust on it. Here, here's Rebecca picking, picking the berries off the tree. Um, one of my tree jokes I am gonna put in there. So um, it seemed like about 10 years ago, landscape architects, at least in this area, discovered this tree and it's like, oh, it has all these sort of ecological services. Um, you know, it really pr provides wildlife, food for wildlife. It's, um, it's native, it has all these sort of services. So we renamed the tree, the ecological service berry. I know you're laughing out there. So you know, I can't hear you. All right, so another, another fun native tree um, that I've grown for, I've taken care of one when I was at Scott Arboretum, there's kind of a, a clonal tree of this pawpaw. 
And one of my first experiences with it was working with one of the horticulturists at, uh, at the Scott Arboretum. And he's like, oh, try this fruit. And um, I was like, I didn't know the tree. So I just, it was fall and I just bit into the fruit and it's just like sour and puckered my mouth. Um, and, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a fruit that's an acquired taste. Um, and there, there are selections of the plants that have better tasting fruit. Um, but it, it's, it's uh, one of these trees that I've just kind of fallen in love just from that one experience of like biting into a fruit and it's like, what is this? Um, I, I, that's how I learned the tree. And then over the years um, at BBG, we have a few trees and we've just planted about a dozen of them this past, past few years. Um, you can see the flower. This, this flower is very early in the spring. Um, it's fly pollinated. Um, and then here's the fruit down here. Um, the fruit in, in, in nature, the, so this is kind of native, more kind of sort of the south to Midwest. Um, it comes into New York and I'm not so sure it's so native in New England, but, but you can grow it in New England. Um, and then there's, like I said, if you're interested in the fruit, it's kind of a custard tasting fruit. Um, you can find selections of it. It's become very popular in the past 10, 10 15 years. Um, but just the, the flower alone is just something I look for in the springtime. And here's the fall color. Um, again, this can be a, this can be sort of a, a, a clonal tree so that it can kind of spread like sucker through the through an area, um, kind of like bottomlands, moist um, moist soil. Um, it'll it'll deal with some like wet soil a little bit, and it but it can't spread on you. So sometimes you have to do a little bit of pruning to it. Um, I've almost. The, the trees we bought at the Botanic Garden the past few years have all been container grown plants. Um, I've, I've never actually seen it, in my experience, uh, grown bald and burlap or harvest bald and burlap. It's almost always container grown plants. And, and again, we buy on the small side. The small tree tends to get established much quicker. When it's grown in the pot, if you buy a smaller plant, um, if it does have some of the um, sort of rooting problems as far as being uh, root bound a little bit you can root prune it and, and just what you just need to water it right away when you're when you're planting it and keep it watered okay so sources canadensis the eastern red bud um another native tree native throughout new england and new york um this we have one planted in front of our house as a street tree um we we, we have a small collection of it at the botanic garden there's, there's also an Asian variety um, that, that's um, slightly different, but, I let, but the native variety is um, just kind of a, a tough, sort of easy to grow tree. It's, you wanna put some place where it's, it's under some big trees if possible, where a little bit of shade, um, it's gonna do well in that. Um, other than that, it's pretty adaptable. Moist, moist well-drained soil, if possible, probably don't wanna put it into a wet spot. Um, but if you can get it, to, if you can get it to establish, um, and there and there, are, uh, many different cultivars. Everything from like um, one called forest pansy that has like when the leaves come out in the spring, they're kind of purple, and that's actually what we have in our uh, um, in our street tree pit in front of our house here in Brooklyn, um, where you can, the the green leaf here is more common of the the leaf color. Um, and then there's ones that have kind of like these rainbow colors. So some of the leaves are purple, some of the leaves are green. Um, so there's a lot of interesting cultivars to grow. It's, it's, there's been a lot of selections over the years. Again, what I like about it, it's just easy to grow. It's just, if, if you can get it in the ground, almost always buy a container grown now. You need to root prune it, get it planted. It takes a few years to get established. Um, but if you get it in the right spot, it's gonna grow. If it's not in the right spot, it, it my my experience has been they they kind of die off pretty quickly if they're not if they're not too happy. So dogwoods is always it's one of the first trees I've learned um, being a young uh, gardener or horticulturist. Um, so I've always had an affinity for dogwoods. Um, it's Cornus Florida, a native dogwood I love a lot, and then uh, Cornus Cusa. Um, as I was learning please trees and studying at Longwood. Longwood had these big, gigantic, beautiful specimens of Cornus cusa. It's an Asian variety of dogwood. Um, they're just, you know, they're just wonderful trees. Um, difference between the two is Cornus Florida. Uh, there's some disease problems with them. Everything from uh, 
dogwood anthracnose to dogwood boar. But now there's some selections of the trees, um, which I think I have a slide in my next slide, um, that are like more, more disease resistant. Um, but one of the big things that I found my experience with growing dogwoods is that if you can give them some shade, they're an understory tree in a forest. Um, so they want, some, they want to be grown under big trees um, or they want some shade at least for part of the day. Um, if you grow them in the open, I feel like they, that's where they become more stressed and much more vulnerable, especially to the dogwood borer. Um, too much shade, then, then the anthracnose becomes a problem. So you want to kind of have this fine line sort of forest edge area. Um, the cornus cusa tends to be a um, lot, lot more disease resistant. You can grow it in full sun. It doesn't seem to doesn't seem that problematic. Um, the cornus cusa um, is it, uh, the showy bracts tend to be a little bit later, like sort of late spring is where the cornus cusa, cornus florida is sort of before the before the leaves come on. So early spring, you get the, the showy bracts and flowers. The fruit's interesting on, on dogwoods that they're um, um, they're edible. Um, the the kusa is actually like a, you know can be um, interesting fruit to eat um, or droop. Um, Cornus florida the, um, the the birds like them so things things like robins and other things and so they're 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 the animals that are mostly going after that fruit. Um, the cornus kusa the the seed distributor for cornus kusa is this guy because where where it sort of naturally grows these are native. Um, um, animals, so these primates, uh, the monkeys, so they're, they're the seed distributors for the cornus cusa. Fortunately, we don't have those in Brooklyn, but so we have to eat them. Okay, this is the tree that we that we ended up getting for our dogwood in our backyard. It is growing in full sun, but it, it's up against the fence, so it gets a little bit of shade. Um, and and it's, got a, it's got some powdery mildew on it, but other than that, it's been doing really well. It took a few years to get established. It was grown in a container um, and then it's it took about two or three years to actually like root in, um, but now it's now it's actually like kind of taking off. Um, so it's Appalachian Spring, so it, it, it's a little more disease resistant than just the straight species. Okay, Cayenanthus um, or the white fringe tree, uh, another another native. This is sometimes a tree, sometimes a shrub. Often depends how you prune it or how you grow it. Um, again, it's just, you know, it's just one of those trees that has like a, this, this big floral display um, early in the spring. It has these, has these fruits, but you sometimes by the time the leaves come on, you don't see the fruits too much. Um, what I like about this tree is that it's kind of small, and so it's good for like smaller areas, but it's just, it's just like so resistant. Um, you can do, <clears throat> you can really, um, uh, like again, just just give it like moist, well-drained soil, full sun, and kind of let it go. Um, you, know, you can do some pruning over time. Um, they are um, surprisingly they're they're on our list. So we uh, we have a uh, in New York City, in southern New England. I'm not sure about northern New England, but we have the emerald ash borer. Um, so the, uh, these are in the um, same family, and so they they're actually susceptible to the emerald ash borer. Um, so I'm just going to kind of move along here. Uh, so it's the Gladitsia, the honey locust tree. So if you're looking for a shade tree, another native tree, um, easy to grow. It's a good urban tree. Um, it has these, um, the straight species gets these big spikes and uh, big pods or a, a legion. Um, and this is the seed distributor, so giant sloths. So we're just waiting for the giant sloths to come back. All right, just kind of moving along. So Helicia is uh, Carolina Silverbell. Again, this is another like kind of understory tree though, can kind of get larger in the canopy. Um, I almost always buy this bald and burlap. I've seen it in containers and I've had much luck with that. Um, this tree flowers before it leaves out. So it's sort of like a very early, early, early spring flower. Um, it's, it's not that common. I don't see a lot of it. I see a lot in botanic gardens, that type of thing, but I don't see a lot in the landscape. So it's something, something that um, when we have more space uh, to grow, we'd like to grow some more of these. Okay, and there's the flower. That's why you want to grow it. Witch hazels, there's a lot of the native witch hazels, and then there's all the Asiatic witch hazels. Um, again, you know, it's just, just a, a wonderful tree. There's, there's cultivars of so many things, even the native ones. Um, then you need to be careful with which hazel is how you prune it. Um, if you 
a lot of the cultivars are grafted and you got to make sure like you're you're keeping that original stem and you don't lose the original stem because if you let it sucker from the root system um you're going to get it's going to revert back to the um to the to the straight species and you're going to lose the cultivar uh selection okay junipers uh what i've, what I've learned about growing juniper especially like um these are um pioneer plants so these these grow where where the soil has really been disturbed in nature um but what they're really good at is they can terraform the, the soil for you so if you have like a really hard like mineral soil like especially in an urban area um we did a project once on a where we're, uh, a community garden was eventually going to be um that land that the new york city had like uh, basically imploded a building and just put a cap of dirt over top of it and so for about three or four years we, we bought uh, about a hundred of these um junipers and, and we just grew them in there and they in within about three years like it really changed the whole soil where we we're able to we thinned them out and then we could grow other things in that soil so it's, so it's just a good good plant where you have problematic soil um uh, as long as it's dry that's that's you just need dry well-drained soil uh Nissa sabbatica there's uh this is our uh natives um sour gum or tupelo um, this is a tree I love. Uh, when I worked at Scott Arboretum, we replaced a lot of um, old elm trees and oak trees with this tree. Um, there's a cultivar wild, uh, wildfire that has this brilliant fall color to it. Um, again, you know, I've seen this grown in containers and I, I bought it bald and burlap. This is a tree that's a difficult transplant, so you want to buy it as small as possible. I, I bought a container, root printed and planted, and most of the time it takes, but it's a tree that if you buy too big, um, it, it, you might have trouble getting established. So buy small. Um, Oxydendron, another um, sort of native tree, but more like to like Tennessee Valley, that area. Um, it's just a tree that I've always fallen in love with. Um, you have it's it's in the um, um, Heath and Heather family. Um, so you have like these little like kind of. Um, uh, blueberry type flowers on it. Um, it in the flowers, the, the pods persist in the winter time. Um, you get one excellent fall color. Um, again, buy it really, really small. It's a slow grower. It's, it's, it's something you want to grow as a specimen tree. Um, if you have room, like plant four or five of them around, um, put them together. And then running out of time here, but I just kind of want to like, talk about oaks and oaks are just like one of the what, what's um Doug Tallamy if you're familiar with this work it, oaks is what he calls like sort of one of the keystone plants so not only like there are so many native oaks to grow but they're also uh, a plant that's going to provide uh resources for a lot of wildlife in the garden now some of this wildlife is is caterpillars for um they're, they're going to develop into moth and sometimes butterflies but those caterpillars become a major food source. There's over like 500 different um, uh, caterpillars that can grow onto or uh, uh, associated with oak species, uh, which is a huge number. And that's that's the food source for a lot of birds, migratory birds um, uh, and different birds. And so even in the wintertime, the, the birds that stick around in the wintertime, they're a little like inchworm types. Um, uh, insects that, are, that live on oaks within the uh, crevices of the bark, and that's what they're eating in the wintertime. So if you have opportunity to grow oaks, and oaks want to be together, like so grow oaks, um, you know, don't grow one oak, grow like, like 10 oaks where you, where you have space. The advantage of, of grouping oaks together is they tend not to get too big. The individual tree tends to not to get too big. I'm just going to skip through here, but you can also uh, get flying squirrels maybe. Um, but here's a dense hedge row. This is um, in Brooklyn Bridge Park in Brooklyn. Uh, but like putting these plants together, you tend not to get a giant oak when they grow, when they start to mature. But if you get enough together, you'll get a, um, you, you'll get a, a mass of oaks, but, but no one oak is going to be like overwhelming. Okay, and then sassafras. The top, the top picture up here is actually at Poly Hill uh, from when we were there a few years ago. Uh, sassafras just, you know, I mean, what can you say? It's just, just beautiful fall color. They're tough trees. Um, I, I buy them in containers. They're 
I buy them small. They grow really, they get established and grow really fast. You have this, um, kids love, you can show the, the, the different leaf formations, um, the, the, the mitten, the, um, what we call the, the, um, uh, the glove over here and then the pot holder over there. Um, so they have the three different leaves on them. Moist roll drain soil. Um, like I said, buy small. Uh, you don't need to buy a big one. Um, they grow so fast. Um, and eventually they, they can um, grow into be a decent sized shade tree, but, but best grown where you can put them all together in sort of a grove. And there, there's the fall color. Okay. And then just um, two of my favorite, the bald cypress and dawn redwood. The bald cypress is, is a, a native tree, native more to the southeast. It, um, native, uh, its native range comes all the way up to, um, to Trap Pond in uh, Delaware. But I, when I, I, I did an internship at Mount Auburn Cemetery in Boston, and we grew uh, bald cypress up there, it did really well. Um, on the right hand side is the Dawn Redwood, which is not a native tree or it used to be native in North America millions of years ago or wherever North America was at the time. So there's fossil records of it, um, but, but a, a small population was found in China in the in 1930s and then seeds were brought back by the um, Arnold Arboretum. Um, so trees that trees of the Dawn Redwood that you see are, you know, probably 1948, I think is around when some of the first seed distributions happen. So, um, so none of the trees are older than from 1948. The ones we have at the Botanic Garden are over hundred feet tall. So we don't really know how tall they're gonna get. Maybe they'll get um, twice that tall, um, time will tell, but they're just, they, they're deciduous conifer. Um, I find as an urban tree, Dawn Redwood has like a very forgiving root system. So if you're gonna garden around it, kind of thing, it's a deciduous conifer, so it has the advantage in the winter time. You lose the foliage, so you get some light in the wintertime. Um, and the bald cypress is um, sort of similar. Bald cypress sometimes, um, it's, it's very adaptable, but really likes wet soil when you, where that's uh, an issue. Um, sometimes you'll get those knees. I might have a picture there. Here's the knees over here. Um, but sometimes um, I find like with the bald cypresses is, is that they can get spider mites and other things. Um, so it depends on the, on the situation. If I have a lot of space, um, the exception of my backyard in Brooklyn where we planted a, um, the, the bald cypress, but we planted a cultivar that's supposedly a lot more narrow and compact um, that, that we hope that's gonna be, um, you know, in time it's gonna grow tall, but it's hopefully to cover like a five-story building when we look out of our back window. And then the, the dawn redwood turns this beautiful fall color, it's the, the meta sequoia. Um, and you can just like, you, if you have the space, this is, this is what you can get. And you wanna plant, the, if you can plant these in a grove, um, you'll, uh, it's, it's just gonna be someplace you're just gonna wanna go and lay down in the grove. Um, which right here. And then I think this is the last one. This is. This is a tree, it's, not a, it's, it's one of the non-native trees. This is the um, uh, Picea orientalis. Um, this, this spruce is uh, a good alternative where we're losing our hemlocks as landscape trees and we're losing them in the forest. This is one of the few sort of spruces or these, these larger conifers that can tolerate a little bit of shade. They're just a beautiful tree, they're soft, they're very slow growing. Um, I've, I've bought them both in containers and in bald and burlap. The trouble is I just finding them in the nursery. They're not that common, uh, but when you find them, you should buy them and, uh, and they need a little bit of space, but they are super slow growing. So it's going to take some time. So just to sum everything up, um, so plant trees, buy them small, mostly native and protect as many old ones as you can. That's pretty much my, my spill of what I've learned over the past 30 years. Uh, so I think so here I am. Thank you. I think Liz is going to come back on if you have a few questions. I think we have a few minutes left. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. That was great. Thank you for sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom about trees. And I know I was laughing at your tree jokes and I'm sure everyone else was, even though you can't hear them. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we're going to go through some questions. Um, Chris 
I was going to answer some of your questions. Um, so if you have any questions that you didn't put in the Q&A box yet, um, feel free to put in some questions now. Um, and we're just going to take a few minutes to go through questions. So anything you want to ask in Arborist, feel free to put it in the Q&A. Um, so our first question, I think this was from the very beginning of your presentation. So I don't know if you remember this photo, but um, the question is, is that a cryptomeria in Chris's backyard? Yes, there's two cryptomerias. Um, the first two that we planted back there were, were um, bald and burlap and they didn't fit through the house because everything that goes into our backyard gets carried through the house. Um, so many years ago, I moved a pretty good sized cryptomeria um, at the Botanic Garden back in the 90s and we did it bare root. It was too big to, we couldn't, we couldn't move it because of the weight if we dug a bald and burlap and we transplanted it that way. So what we did is we, we dug it up and then we bare root it and we moved it and it was spring and we planted it and it's been doing great. It didn't seem like you even skipped a beat. Um, so with the, the first two trees we bought um, that were too big, that wouldn't fit through the house, I decided, well, you know, I'm just gonna bare root them. I'm just gonna knock all the soil off the, the root ball. We'll carry it through the house. I'll root prune it and plant it. They last it for about a year, then browned up the next year. So they, they didn't make it. Um, and then the next two, we bought um, much smaller in container um, and they did great um, until we had like a big windstorm. And then when the problems with container grown plants, it takes them a while to get rooted in. I don't like staking up plants unless I have to. Um, so after about two years in the ground, when they were just starting to put some size on, uh, one of them blew over, um, the other one kind of leaned a lot so I staked them back up and since then they've been doing fine um they've they've probably tripled in size in five years cool um all right well thank you and then I think um so someone's asking about Layla and Cyprus I don't know okay. what the question is exactly but if you want to talk about that at all okay. um, in uh, New England um, well, I can tell you about uh, New York, um, Leyland Cypress. We, we, we have a big hedge near our conservatory that's, um, it's almost, the way, way it was planted is almost in this little tree pit. It's like about three feet wide and about 100 feet long. And there's uh, about 30 Leyland Cypresses. In. And then in our nursery area, there was another like kind of row of Leyland Cypress back there. Um, we used to prune them, we used to not shear them, but we'd go in and prune them um, and we'd keep them about 15, 15 feet tall, a little bit. We prune them in June um, and then we stopped doing that for, can't even remember the reason why we stopped, but it was one of those, you know, sort of administration decisions like, you know, we have more other priorities and then they, they like took off and now they're about 40 feet tall. They're tough. They're the the area that they're growing in a um, sort of a pitted area, the part of the road side of it is crumbling into them. Um, they get debris thrown in there. They get salt damaged in the winter time and they don't skip a beat. Uh, we've lost a few in some storms because of the rooting space is just limited. So in short, they're a super tough tree. Um, they, want, they want some space to grow um, and they'll probably um, grow bigger than you ever want them to. Um, I don't know about deer damage. That's what I, I don't have experience with. So um, you'd have to, I would look into whether or not how much deer love them, um, if that's a problem for you. In Brooklyn, it's not a problem. Yeah. Um, if you're on the island, it's definitely a problem. So that's definitely a yeah. good thing to look into. Um, all right. So our next question, do you have any advice about planting and making Stewardia pseudocamellia thrive? Um, we have one in our garden. Um, you know, I've, it's, I've, I've grown plenty of them. Um, again, you know, it's, I, I've planted them both like very large specimens um, that were bald and burlap. There was a, a planting at the Botanic Garden that we have near, our, um, near the, um, what we call the Palm House, which is like our it's kind of catering space. And so we had two big ones and they're, they're, um, they're actually the Korean one, which are very similar to the Pseudocamellia. Um, they were, they were um, probably about a three foot diameter root ball when we planted them. And 
in the ground. And about two years later, it, they just took off. And uh, we print them. I print them every once in a while. They're in a sunny spot. They're like growing next to a, um, a, an old greenhouse, and they get they get uh, they get um, a lot of exposure. But I haven't seen much uh, much damage with that. Um, but where I've seen them like really thrive is forest edge. Um, we have another our largest specimen we grow of the um, of the Stewardia um, is in our. Um, Osborne Garden, which is grown underneath the other trees, and it's probably like a foot and a half in diameter at the base, um, but it's only like maybe like 40 feet tall at the tallest. At the Scott Arboretum, there was this beautiful down, we had this area, this holly collection down in this meadow area, and it was a forest edge, and there was like somebody had planted like about two dozen, two dozen of them in, the, in there, and they were like tall and spindly. But probably about, you know, this is going back quite a few years. They were probably about like 40 feet tall. And that was, you know, beautiful bark. And you never saw the flowers because the canopy was so high. So the one I grew in the backyard in Brooklyn was like too much shade. It got um, overgrown by a, a big thug of a uh, um, oak leaf hydrangea. Um, it was multi stem. It was actually, I bought it for a client and then they didn't want it. So I threw it in the backyard. Um, and it's been struggling. It's finally like starting to, uh, I just noticed this year, it finally has flower buds after sitting there and not doing much for five years. So I think they're easy to grow. Um, just if you can find that sweet spot of like a little bit of shade um, and, you know, but, um, like a good garden soil, they're, they're probably happiest there. Um, Great. Um... All right, and then we have a question about transplanting native saplings. Okay. Um, so the question is, um, is it possible to successfully transplant um, native samplings that are just naturally growing on my property to other spots in the yard? So for example, like sassafras, red maple, red oak, dogwood. So, so I'll start with the sassafras. So the sassafras might be a little difficult. They tend to be sort of, um, uh, clonal. So oftentimes, like what you, it, when you find like saplings of sassafras, you, you think they're an individual tree, but oftentimes they could be a root sucker of another tree. Um, so those can be a little bit difficult to transplant. If you can find a true sapling and if you can get enough soil around it, and I would, I would dig the hole where you want to put it, go get it. And I would do it before the leaves start, before it starts uh, pushing out leaves. So I'd probably do it in like you know, depending where you live, like from late March to very early April, um, and just dig in and move it, you you would probably have fairly good success. Though I think it's a little more difficult to transplant. Um, the oaks are a little um, oaks as seedlings are actually a little bit easier because they tend to have um, one of the characteristics of a very young oak is that it has a tap root. It loses that tap root. It, that's a very like. Um, sort of that early phase trait, it loses the taproot um, as, it, as it grows bigger. But when you still have that taproot, you can kind of dig, uh, dig a deep hole. Um, and and I've, I've moved lots of uh, oak, set, uh, oak seedlings. I've, I've also like pulled them up when they're really small and replanted them and done pretty well. Um, also growing oaks from uh, acorns, it's not that, not that difficult. You don't need to be like, uh, a super propagator to do it and it's a pretty easy way to like if you know the tree it's coming off of then at least you know the species really well um and that's also an easy way and oaks as as young trees oaks grow pretty quickly so even if you're just starting from a like starting an acorn and, and uh sowing that um you can usually get it um you know a, a decent sized sapling within like a year or two from that i forget the other species that you uh mentioned uh, yeah, there were quite a few listed. So okay. um, yeah, it was sassafras you covered. That's one of the clonal ones. Um, red maple, red oak, dogwood. You talked about you talked about oak. So I think you pretty much covered. Okay, I would just yeah. say with maple, maples are more difficult because they tend to have like that shallower root system, and they tend to have like even even as a young sapling, they tend to have a pretty woody root system. Um, so I would you know if you find it small enough, um, I would still try it. I mean. If you're not killing plants, you're not gardening. So, you know, why not? All right. Um, 
So a question about a Dawn Redwood. So my six foot tall Dawn Redwood hasn't moved much vertically in the past 10 years. I inherited it. How can I help it? Um, I would think there's something going on down below. I bought a um, Dawn Redwood from Home Depot um, that, they, that they had marked off substantially because they think it was in the fall time and they probably thought the tree was dying because it was losing its needles. So I got it for like 10 bucks or something. Um, and it was it was overgrown in a container and planted it about like three or four years ago. And it hasn't grown at all. Um, when I planted it, it was so pop bound. I root pruned it pretty heavily, uh, but I think it's just gonna take some years. And, but my experience is with Don Redwood. I've, we have this grove of Don Redwood um, in the botanic garden that's grown in our nursery. And these are some of the original seeds from uh, grown from original seed from the Arnold Arboretum. So they're, uh, you know, they're about hundred foot tall, but they seed all over. Uh, and, the, and because it's in our nursery, we have a lot of pots and they tend to like, the, um, the seeds will fall into the pot and then they'll germinate in there. Um, but I, I've transplanted those seedlings um, and put them in flower uh, like window boxes in Brooklyn that like freeze solid in the winter and come back the next spring. Um, so I, I would see what's going on underground. You might want to dig around it and then see if, like, if you have girdling roots or something, and you might be able to get in there and do some root pruning. Um, I wouldn't do the whole, I wouldn't root prune the whole thing, but maybe just in sections and see if that was going on. You also don't, um, I've never seen them grow too well, um, in like wet soil. So if you have like drainage issues, that might be a problem too. I swear with the, um, bald cypress, that wouldn't be a problem. All right. Um, so we have another question about sassafras. Um, does Chris have a problem with sassafras root sprouting? I know they do. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's just what they do. They're going to, um, they're, they're going to, they're going to colonize that way. That's, that's how sassafras works. So if you have this space where you can kind of grow a colony of sassafras, that's, that's where they're happiest. Um, we have, you know, we have a, um, a good sized tree at the Botanic Garden that's just kind of a one off tree. Um, so I've seen them grown individually. Uh, where I used to live in Brooklyn before we moved here, our, our, the neighbors behind us at our back window had a gigantic sassafras, probably um, 30 inches in diameter, um, at, at, you know, around the base, around the trunk, um, and, you know, five stories tall. Um, so they can grow into like this individual tree. And that one was never like, um, suckering up, but um, I think if you give them just the, that's an urban condition, so there may not be as much opportunity um, just from other disturbance where they're just not going to spread that way. I'm a little worried in our backyard where we have actually three sassafras. Um, we're going to have to thin them out at some point, and I'm sure we're going to have to like uh, uh, take out suckering as they go along. So, so it can be a problem, but in the in the right space, that could be like you can make that to your advantage because you can just plant a couple of them, but then you can have like a whole grove of them right. that plant a bunch of trees, yeah. Okay, so we just have one more question. Okay. Um, how do you get a Harlequin glory bower to grow beyond five to six feet? Ours keep showing up and eventually top out. Don't know. <laughs> Don't know the answer to that one. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, again, if it's, if it's not growing, then like you need to, you need to like kind of look at like, you know, plants need light, they need water, they need nutrients. Um, if something's not working, there's usually some, and they need space to grow. So if something's not working, I kind of like, you know, start with those basics. Is it, is it getting enough light, the proper amount of light? Is it getting enough water? Is it getting too much water? Is it getting, uh, you know, does it have the nutrients that it needs in the soil? Is the soil the right soil? Are you over fertilizing? Are you doing things like that? So kind of like with a car, if your car is not running, like you look, you know, did I put gas in the car? Like start with the, start with the basics. Um, and sometimes, you know, I mean, sometimes um, I, I, I think most, most problem with trees as far as for growth and things is underground. There's usually something going on um, either with the soil or with the root system of the plant. So that's in, just in general. All right. Um, 
So that was all of our tree questions. We do have um, one last question from Rebecca McMacken, who was oh, no. that adorable child in your first slide. And can you tell us more about it? <laughs> <laughs> no child was harm in the making of that, of that <laughs> photograph. Um, that's our son, Milo, who probably was about four or five at the time we were digging up a tree at his grandpa's house. He was paid generously with ice cream. <laughs> no labor laws were broken in, the, in that process. That's great. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for answering all those questions. Thank you for sharing all your information on trees that you've learned over the years and sharing your stories with us. Um, it's been really great to have you here. And thank you to everyone for joining and being here today. Um, and again, you can check our website for more lectures and events and classes and tours that are coming up. So thank you, everyone. And I hope you all have a good rest of your evening. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone.